what do you know about factor investing? This is the thing that has been taking the investment industry by a storm for the past 10 or 15 years, but there are still plenty of people who don't know what factor investing is. Have you thought about whether or not it makes sense to tilt toward growth or value, small cap or large cap, or anything else that you might want to think of, and in particular, low volatility stocks at a time when stock markets are expensive? We'll be exploring that this week. Make Better Wealth Decisions, a podcast that explores how financial advisors' blind spots can harm your investments. I'm your host, John DeGuy, a portfolio manager with Design Securities in Toronto. In this podcast, we'll provide advice on how you can achieve better outcomes by maximizing investments and minimizing taxes. Let's put our thinking caps on as we consciously decide to get smarter about our money. This week, we're joined by Trevor Cummings. He is the Vice President of ETF Distribution for TD Asset Management. He spent many years as one of the pioneers and technical experts in the Canadian exchange trade fund industry. Trevor, welcome. Thanks for having us, John. Happy to be here. We have talked about a number of things on this podcast, but one of the things we've never talked about that I thought you'd be a great person to ask about is the idea of factors and factor-based investing, where you deliberately overweight a certain aspect. Could you perhaps begin by just providing a general overview of what factor investing is and why people might want to pursue it? Yeah, sure, sure. So factors can be thought of as branches to the tree, maybe, of investing. There are different factors that have different kind of common themes or elements to them. And the debate rages on as to how many there are, but I'm going to go with five or maybe five and a half main factors, right? So these are, again, thematics that you could sort different stocks in the stock market into. So one of the biggest, most popular, probably most well-known one would be value could be considered a factor. And that means buying uh, businesses that are inexpensive on like a price to earnings or price to sales, price to book kind of multiples, maybe all of the above, right? Um, another popular factor would be growth or momentum. So these would typically be businesses that are prioritizing revenue growth as opposed to earning growth. Companies like technology companies, some of the time would be folding any retained earnings back into sort of hyper growing or hyper scaling their business. So they typically wouldn't have a dividend. They might not have positive earnings per share, or if they did, it would be rather minute. Um, and then some of the other factors, I think that the main sort of half a dozen or so, five or five and a half, maybe the others could be size. So typically as I think as we're taught small companies outperform large companies because they're hungrier, they're in that growth phase of their uh, business. They do so with higher volatility. It's not a freebie necessarily, right? So size would be another factor. Quality could be a factor meaning uh, companies that are very consistent in their outcome, slow and steady, not necessarily, you can have high growth, but quality, but predictability of earnings, perhaps as a, a lesser known factor. I don't know that yield is a factor. Maybe it's a half a factor, yield or dividends or income or something like that. To me, that's an offshoot to quality because that's usually where you find it. And then maybe the factor that is near and dear to me, I think it's a really interesting one, is risk or is volatility as a factor. And how this manifests, John, in the ETF world is there's about four or five major ETF companies offering low volatility ETFs, for example. And the idea behind the volatility factor or the risk factor, whatever you prefer to call it, is actually something of a really interesting anomaly. Lower risk businesses have a tendency to outperform the market over time. And that is very paradoxical, right? I think in life, we're generally taught no risk, no reward. If, if you want that brass ring, you have to reach for it, all sorts of things like this, right? And there's something really interesting in the investing world where uh, reaching for uh, high beta, high risk, high standard deviation securities is not necessarily risk that investors compensated for. And the flip side of that is, is actually also true in, in the sense that buying uh, lower risk businesses can sometimes be very rewarding in the sense that you might actually outperform a, a benchmark. I think if we widen back out or we, we 
take it back to bird's eye view of factors, um, there's this cruel truth maybe in factor investing, or maybe a couple cruel truths to, to think about. One is if we all do it, it doesn't work, right? If, if we all plowed in the entire market, plowed into value investing at the same time, well, we're going to bid those securities up. They're no longer going to be inexpensive relative to the market and, and it falls, uh, falters, maybe stumbles. Um, if you think about growth or momentum type investing, if we all went there, um, then that would be this self-fulfilling prophecy to a point. But then again, it too would break down. If we all went into small cap investing, we're going to be competing to buy those shares. They're going to appreciate in price nice in the early days, but eventually they're not small companies anymore. Um, the, the way, they're just the, companies the, without a track record. The, the way I oftentimes explain it is that the markets are relatively self-correcting and fairly efficient. And as a result, if there's a mispricing, and you can make more money, get an outsized gain by buying more value stocks or growth stocks, which is the flip side of value, or buying more momentum stocks or small caps, those mispricings would be arbitraged away if everyone crowded into that one trade and bought a whole lot of the thing that was cheap. Uh, after a while, buying a whole bunch of cheap stuff ends up driving up the price and suddenly it's not cheap anymore. And the reason for buying it ostensibly disappears in a puff of logic, right? So it's one of those things where it, it works as long as um, there are competing viewpoints about how yes. the market is constructed and what's currently cheap and what's currently expensive and what might have a better view for the future. And that's a bit of a mugs game as well, but people have, a, have an opinion that they want to express. Let's see if we can dive a little bit further, Trevor, into this notion of the volatility high vol versus low vol and the risk factor. It's one that is relatively new. People have not talked about it really until maybe five, six, seven, eight years ago. It was not something that was talked about even, let's say, in 2010 or 2012. It's the sort of thing that is relatively current. It's not, that, and, and to the extent that people talked about it before then, there weren't any products that you could buy that would express the sentiment to try to capitalize on the factor that we've identified. So could you take a moment to maybe explain a bit more about how the, the factor of risk or volatility came to be recognized and how it's being exploited and how it's being used with product development in the here and now. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So to carry on or to segue, right? If we all plowed into low volatility investing at the same time, it too would start to stumble or it would, it would erode its, its value or its utility. I think what, what I would say about Lowball is it's been identified and packaged conveniently in the last decade or so. I think before then, people were probably doing it uh, maybe by accident or by proxy, right? In, in the sense that what low volatility does is it, it, like a couple of behavioral attacks, if you will, right? And so you can start with the philosophy of why it works. And then we could talk a little bit about some mathematics around it too, right? So philosophically speaking, everybody wants the newest, shiniest object, right? That this is a market in particular, the investment uh, industry that predicates itself on building newer, better products and offerings and things like this. And occasionally we get it right. What I would say about low volatility is low vol is the antithesis of that. Lolo says, wait a second, we've got these shiny objects over here. And, and these days it would be things like artificial intelligence. It would be things like chip stocks and so on and so forth. If you went back a couple of years ago, I think the shiny object would be things like- Marijuana stocks uh, other, other, seven or eight years ago. Yeah, you can, and, and you can say commodities where the go-go stocks may be of the, the global financial crisis, right? Obviously wrapped in some real estate, but there were, there's always a boom market in some kind of asset class or some category of the market somewhere. Minvol or lowvol kind of work because what they do is they say, what if we just ignored all the hullabaloo, ignored all of the headlines and the things that are trying to sell newspapers and get clicks, just focused on businesses that carry on doing their boring work as they always have, that they do have elements of value, they have elements of quality, but they also have elements of low volatility in their return profile. That could be low standard deviation or vol variance. That could be low beta to the market, et cetera, et cetera. And so the low volatility premise is, can you be successful as an investor by ignoring the stuff that's 
really the center of the market's attention. Maybe the way to think of it is we overdo it, right? Uh, human beings, human nature is to overweight the data that's easiest to see. So everybody is talking about the same seven stocks these days because that's the ones that are in the news all the time. And Lowell says, okay, well, if those securities are overanalyzed, they're overrepresented in portfolios, they're over scrutinized, they're over invested. What about the market or the portion of the market that's under analyzed, that is forgotten by the market, that's under scrutinized, under analyzed? You think of a, a Mag 7 stock, take your pick. There's probably a hundred different equity analysts doing research reports. And I'm not sure that analyst number 80 is going to have anything meaningfully different to say than analyst number 25. And yet, if you can find a, a business that might have a hundred year history, but has 10 analysts covering it, there might be some opportunity there uh, to turn over the rocks of the boring businesses. Maybe boring is beautiful from a, a sort of psychological standpoint. It might be worth noting that as we, I, I always think that I maybe jumped ahead a bit too much because there are three main paradigms of investing that have maybe held sway over the past hundred years. For the first 75 years or so, it was stock picking. It was individual security by security selection and hiring an active manager. And then perhaps at the turn of the millennium in Canada and, and maybe earlier in other parts of the world, certainly in the US, it was the idea of indexing where you're just low cost beta tracking the performance of a benchmark. And as I say, it's only been in the past, in the relatively recent past, that this third way, which is a bit of a hybrid between the two, of believing that markets are more or less efficient in keeping the costs down, but tilting towards certain factors. And so as a simple example of what I would give with regard to the value factor, let's say there are 300 stocks in the TSX 300. Well, all you do is you sort them by price earnings ratio and you the 150 ones that have low PEs are the ones you buy, and you don't buy the 150 that have a high PE, and then you can decide whether you want to equal weight them or cap weight them or, or whatever. But at any rate, with one simple decision about uh, are you over or under this line, you've made a value play, uh, you've expressed a sentiment of being a value investor without spending a lot of time being analyst number 20 or 85 out of many analysts, because simply you're simply looking at the numbers and drawing a line and making the buys based on what side of the line you're on. And it's easy, it's intuitive. And I think a lot of people find that attractive because they say, okay, I think it makes sense, for instance, to, to keep my volatility low, but I don't really know how to do it. And I don't know that I have to pay extra to do it if you can just do a quick sort. The thing that I was going to say about low volatility is that so far, People would say that we've had a fair bit of volatility thus far in 2024. I think it's actually been relatively benign because most of the volatility has been on the upside. And I'm one of those sort of people who thinks, well, it's really only volatility when it's down. People don't call it volatility if the market's going up. But if it's going down, they, they call it volatility. And we haven't had a lot of down times. But it is precisely because we haven't had a lot of down times that there are many people who think markets are expensive right now. And as a result, uh, it might make a good deal of sense to buy things that are lo low volatility um, slants because of that uh, predisposition and how it might save you from a circumstance that fortuitously hasn't really shown up in the past little bit, but could rear its head at any time. I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Absolutely. Recency bias being what it is, being a pleasant 2024 so far, knock on wood, so far so good with a couple of months to go here. I think that it would be lovely and it would be wonderful if the markets just carried in on um, perpetuity as they have been this year. And, and there's been a couple of bounces at the beginning of September, the beginning of August, but they, they've just been swallowed up. Life is very pleasant these days. The seas are, are relatively calm. I think smooth seas make for poor sailors, as the saying goes. And if we think about the context of our portfolios, Maybe just to drop a, a couple of mathematical points, right? One is we, we did a study in 2022 and we took the TSX uh, composite names. We sorted them into five buckets or five uh, quintiles, highest risk, the lowest risk or lowest volatility. And the fifth bucket, the, the bucket with the highest volatility in it actually underperformed the TSX. And all four of the other buckets outperformed the TSX. And, and of course, 
the one with the lowest level of volatility had the highest air performance, the TSX. That's backwards looking, but in the long run, we would expect that to sort of continue. The other math, and you kind of touch on this, John, is like the aim small, miss small, right? If we are right, or some sort of a correction. Maybe we're due, overdue, I don't know. But if there is some kind of storm clouds on the horizon, the aim small, miss small sort of feature of low volatility is very, very useful to investors. And what I mean by that is, again, think of, say, the market, and let's just call the market as being up 30% this year. We'll just call it that. If the market were down 30% this year, $100 turns into 70. That's pretty easy. But if the market then rallied 30% off of that low, you're still underwater because your $70 turns into 91, right? 70 times 1.3. If you're down 40%, $100 turns into 60, and then you rally 40%, now you're only at $84. You need additional years just to get back to break even in your portfolio. And yet, if we think about a mere 10% correction, $100 turns into 90, and then a 10% rally off those lows, you're at 99, you're, you're almost back to square one. The less of the downside that you capture in your portfolio, the better position you're going to be for recovery and ultimately making new gains. And so low volatility, to your point, as a tilt maybe on index portfolios or as a tactical ad, given where we are in the cycle these days, is useful because it lowers your downside capture. So a borrow the mutual fund lingo, right? On a mutual fund world, they have an upside downside capture. And it's a measure of how much of the market's upside does a strategy capture and how much when the market's down, how much does it capture? And the thing is, if you could create some mythical investment that was 120% upside and 80% downside, sign me up. That's a pretty good investment if I knew that was going to happen. ETFs, passive ETFs are 100, 100, right? So 100% of the downside, less a tiny fee. And so the low volatility, the, the upside downside capture is maybe 70, 70, depends on the strategy. Sometimes it's as low as 50, 50. The cost of doing business means you'll only get half the upside. If it's 50% of the upside and 50% of the downside, you will lag when the market is up. 30, you might only be up 15, but if the market's down 30, you're only down 15. And the premise again, back to the beginning is you haven't dug such a deep hole for yourself to get out of, and then you can stay invested, so to speak. You win by not losing as the saying goes, right? You minimize the losses. Yeah, but there's a simple math number there that you take the percent, if it's a multiple of 10, remove the zero and square it. And that's the round trip. So a, as you said, a 10% drop. You take away the zero, square the one, you get one, and that's 99. And if it's, for instance, if it's a 50% drop, five squared is 25, that means you're going to end up at 75. And by the way, it works in both directions. So you can go up by 50 and then down by 50. You go from 150 down to 75, or you can go from 100 down to 50 and then up to 75 by going up by 50. So it's, it's easy. Just take the number in, in around numbers. If it's a multiple of 10, take away the zero, square it. And that's the, the round trip, whether you go up and down or down and up. So the point yes. that I wanted to get at with that was that if you're an investor in 2024 and you think markets are expensive, one of the things that financial advisors say they offer as part of their value proposition is behavioral coaching. And one of the things that I say all the time is that you can coach all you want, but if for whatever reason, the person you're coaching doesn't follow what you're asking them to do saying the right thing isn't really that useful. Like it's really what happens where the rubber hits the road is where you modify people to behave in, in a proper way. And it seems to me, therefore, that if you're an investor who might get antsy or nervous if markets are dropping, then using the low vol strategy might make a great deal of sense in order for you to maintain your resolve and maintain your strategic asset allocation as a result of the volatility that may or may not come, but if it does, it's probably more likely that you'll be able to stay the course if you're in a low vol product or strategy. Absolutely. The best asset allocation is the one that the investor is going to keep, right? So I think a lot of our industry is trying to create the perfect portfolio. And I think the pursuit of perfection is folly. The pursuit of excellence is very wise and noble. We, we all deserve excellent portfolios. But 
perfect portfolio doesn't really exist. And I think thinking about psychology as one of the main drivers to success or failure as an investor, stretch, floss, listen to your investment professional. I think there are things we should all aspire to do more of. All right, Trevor, can we end by having you offer uh, some pearls of wisdom with regard to making better wealth decisions? If you were to impart one bit of advice to the people listening today, what would you encourage them to do so that they can make better wealth decisions? I think the, the probably the best advice I have is to slow things down and listen to the advice you're given. Um, we are all bombarded with data. There's television channels, there are websites, there are still, you know, magazines and publications that are all telling us what we should be doing with our investments. And I think what's important to remember is there's multitude. There are myriad ways to be successful as an investor. You can do it via passive investing all the time. You could do it with a lot of low volatility. You could do it with a combination of different things. There isn't one asset allocation that is the universal truth or the optimal portfolio. But I think listening to your investment advice that you're given from your professional, whether it's a portfolio manager, a counselor, or what have you, and taking the time to recognize that this is a portfolio that is optimized for me and my tolerance for risk, my investment objectives, my time horizon. Don't overdo it on falling for the latest greatest. Be very, very careful when you make your important decisions, if you will, is probably the best advice I can leave people with. Thank you very much, Trevor. It's been a real pleasure having you on this week. Thanks, John. Appreciate your time. John Degui is a portfolio manager with Design Securities in Toronto. The views expressed in this program are not to be construed as specific advice. It is recommended that you consult a qualified advisor before taking action. His books, The Professional Financial Advisor 4, Stand Up to the Financial Services Industry and Bullshift are available through Amazon and in bookstores throughout Canada. You can reach John at 647-STAND-UP. That's 647-782-6387 or at jdegui at designedsecurities.ca.